talk about the different types of central nervous system complications that occur in LCH, um, uh, how those typically progress, what the risk factors are, um, the recommended evaluation for those patients, and then what treatment options are. Um, so what is central nervous system LCH? Um, well, there are really three different types. The first is um, the endocrine complications of LCH that involve the central nervous system. And they include the list of disorders that you see here that are endocrinologic in uh, nature, uh, diabetes insipidus, growth hormone deficiency, thyroid deficiency, and then various sex hormone deficiencies. And I'm sure that Vasantz is going to talk more about this next in terms of the um, long-term follow-up of patients as well. Uh, secondly, patients with LCH can rarely have mass lesions in the central nervous system. And then finally, uh, I think the newest area that we're becoming aware of uh, is um, uh, the condition of neurodegenerative changes that occur in patients with LCH. And those can be symptomatic in some patients. And other patients may have no symptoms, but may have those changes found on routine follow-up MRI scans. And we'll, again, we're, we're going to talk about each of these conditions. So the first will be the endocrine conditions. So what are the symptoms of diabetes insipidus? Um, well, they're uh, increased thirst and frequent urination. Um, what causes diabetes insipidus in LCH? Um, I think it, at some level we don't really know why LCH cells like to go to this part of the brain. But what we do know is that there is a hormone in your body that uh, regulates uh, fluid balance. It's called vasopressin or ADH. Uh, and it's made in an area of the brain called the hypothalamus. And in LCH, the LCH cells can go to that part of the brain and destroy that part of the hypothalamus so that one is then not able to make vasopressin. Your body doesn't have enough vasopressin, and that signal that the body uses to hold on to fluid is gone. And so in a child with diabetes insipidus, as this condition develops, everything they drink essentially goes through them. And if they're able to drink sufficient fluids to stay hydrated, they'll be okay. But if not, they can quickly become dehydrated. And so before effective treatment was available, this could be a life-threatening condition. Uh, and finally, it's important to remember that this is not a condition that's related to the more common type of diabetes, which is called diabetes mellitus, or sometimes called sugar diabetes. They're completely distinct conditions. Um, so if you have LCH, or your child has LCH, when might you develop diabetes insipidus? Um, well, it can happen as a presenting symptom of longer Hans cell histiocytosis. I've seen some patients who, that's been their um, condition when the diagnosis was first made. Um, I've had other patients who developed diabetes insipidus during the course of treatment. And then other patients who've completed their treatment for um, LCH uh, and then developed diabetes insipidus, as we heard earlier today. Uh, and then it's important to remember that some patients may have other obvious signs of LCH, like the skull or other bone lesions that we've heard about or skin rashes. But there's some patients in whom the only uh, feature of LCH is the diabetes insipidus. And in that case, it can be very difficult to make the diagnosis. Uh, sometimes we have to resort to a biopsy of that area of the brain, which can be very tricky, uh, sometimes risky, but that's the only way to be certain what we're treating. So if you suspect diabetes insipidus in a patient with LCH, how do you make the diagnosis? Uh, well, typically, um, uh, patients would have a uh, water deprivation test where we measure various levels of uh, electrolytes in the body um, after um, withholding fluid from that patient, and we can see if the patient's able to regulate their fluid balance. Uh, and usually patients would also have an MRI of the brain done to look for characteristic changes in the hypothalamus. And we might see any or all of uh, three different sorts of findings. Uh, the most common finding, and it happens to uh, just about every patient who develops um, diabetes insipidus and LCH, is the so-called bright spot in the pituitary gland is lost. If you can see this black arrow here, but here's a bright spot that then has disappeared um, uh, with the development of diabetes insipidus. Some patients may have thickening of the pituitary stalk, and occasionally patients may actually have a, a mass that can be seen on the MRI scan, but uh, the majority of patients do not. And then if you have diabetes insipidus, um, how is it treated? Um, 
And fortunately now, um, we have a synthetic or artificial vasopressin that can be given as a pill, which very effectively regulates fluid balance. So it's no longer a life-threatening condition if it's diagnosed properly, but it, it's a chronic condition, and you're um, stuck with this, unfortunately, the rest of your life. So how common is this condition if you have LCH? Um, these are some data from uh, various studies that have been done. Uh, these studies look at different groups of patients, but you can see that the incidence in uh, uh, some of these studies was as high as 24 uh, percent. Um, uh, other studies, it's much less, so it depends on the patient population that you're looking at. But this is, uh, I think, a, a very common uh, complication either during or after treatment of LCH. Um, so which patients who have LCH are going to be at risk for developing diabetes insipidus? Uh, this is a study from uh, Nicole Groix and her colleagues in Vienna, and they've identified uh, three risk factors for um, diabetes insipidus. Those patients uh, who have multi-system disease, we just heard from Dr. Weitzman that, that multi-system disease is um, a risk factor for uh, poor outcomes in neonates, and it's also a risk factor for developing diabetes insipidus. Patients who have reactivation of their disease are much more likely to develop diabetes insipidus. And then patients who have craniofacial lesions, lesions are, that are around the orbit or the temporal bone, um, are, are two and a half fold more likely to develop diabetes uh, insipidus than other patients. In contrast to patients who have vault lesions or lesions, you know, the rest of the skull, which is a very common area, you can see that their risk is only very slightly increased, and that may not be significant. So we mentioned that diabetes insipidus is the most common complication of uh, endocrine complication of LCH. Um, growth hormone deficiency uh, is also seen. And here are, th are three studies that have been reported in the literature uh, that identified, again, looking at high-risk patients, those with multi-system disease um, or uh, uh, other surveys. Um, they found an incidence of between uh, 9 and 15 percent. Um, and most of the patients who had growth hormone deficiency already had diabetes insipidus in each of these series. So they're usually linked, which makes sense. Um, and then finally, um, you can also have thyroid uh, failure or other endocrinopathies, but those are even less common. So um, if you have a child with LCH and they're not growing properly, uh, it's important that uh, your child, um, that you, you know, raise that with your physician, and often those children would be evaluated by an endocrinologist who would do a thorough evaluation for all the various endocrine abnormalities. Um, this is a question that I'm often asked by um, other physicians more often than patients or families. So just as with um, diabetes insipidus, we have replacement therapy with vasopressin. We have replacement therapy with growth hormone um, for patients who have growth hormone deficiency. But there are many concerns historically about the safety of growth hormone replacement therapy for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is that for many years, uh, growth hormone was derived from um, cadaveric tissue, and so there was a risk of tr viral transmission. Now with synthetic growth hormone or recombinant growth hormone, uh, those risks are now gone. And in that regard, re re um, replacement growth hormone therapy should be very safe. Um, the other concern, which is a little bit more nebulous, is that growth hormone therapy um, may somehow trigger the reactivation of the disease. And that's uh, true, that concern exists not only for LCH, but also for various types of cancer. Um, the data suggests that, in fact, that's not the case, that growth hormone therapy is safe.